into what is an ATA Carnet. It's your passport for goods. It's that simple. Think about you have your personal passport. It allows you to travel around the world, clearing customs or immigration, and going in and going out of many countries. Well, the same idea of the ATA Carnet, but for your commercial goods. It's an international development tool. It really helps aid U.S. businesses expand in foreign markets, as well as foreign businesses come into the United States and expand in the United States. It's an international customs document. It is an international harmonized standard customs document. And what that means is any erroneous information on the carnet can constitute fraud, not only to, U to US Customs and Border Protection, but potentially up to 77 other customs administrations in the world. So it is a very serious document. And in my experience working with different companies, some companies think the carnet, like I did when I was in the fashion industry, it was annoying, and hand it over to an intern or the secretary to handle, not realizing the implications down the line if it is not handled properly. And it is a standardized, harmonized customs document. It's the only customs document of its type that not only touches the hands of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, but potentially up to 77 other customs administrations throughout the world. So what does the Carnet actually do? It allows temporary entry of items, duty-free and tax-free, whether shipped or hand-carried. Temporary means the goods can go out of the United States into a foreign country for one year, not longer. And for any of those who know, um, have had any of my presentations before, I I've start the presentation with the hard and fast rules of Carnet. There are exceptions to every rule, as we all know. But the good rule of thumb is to know if you're planning on doing a shipment for one year or less, ATA Carnet is your best bet. And shipped or hand carried means you can obtain your ATA Carnet from your logistics provider like Scarborough, and you can have them ship handle everything from beginning to end. Or if you decide you want to take a handful of items from the Carnet and you want to jump on a plane for a last minute sales meeting, you can do your own customs clearance at the airport at the ship's office and actually carry the Carnet as well. It's established by an international ATA convention. As I mentioned earlier, it's a World Customs Organization convention. The initial convention is the ATA convention. Then it was modernized by the Istanbul Convention on Temporary Admission. So let's take a little step back from ATA Carnet and talk about temporary importation. What does this mean? It's a process whereby goods are going to enter an economy or enter a country for a limited time period and then come back home, come back to the United States. Obviously, because they're going in and coming out, there should not be a reason to pay the duties taxes to get in to then just re-export them out as they're not formally entering the economy. So there are a couple of options. One option is posting the duty and tax at time of importation and then reclaiming it on time of re-exportation. Commonly referred to in the United States is similar to a duty drawback, not the same, but similar to duty drawback. Another option is posting some form of financial guarantee required by that customs administration. Some countries have temporary importation bond programs. Others require bank guarantees or uh, letters of credit. All depends on the country of import. ATA Carnet, obviously, and is the best option for temporary importation. And finally, smuggling. Yes, smuggling. It is on the screen, and smuggling is illegal everywhere. The reason it's on the screen is because with it, a person intended to or not, sometimes they don't realize they're smuggling. Going back to my fashion history, fashion designers are notorious for grabbing their samples, jumping on a plane and thinking, great, I've got this great sales opportunity at this massive department store in Paris. I'm just going to jump on the plane with my samples, beautifully packed with hang tags on them, get off the Charles de Gaulle airport. Well, French customs, one of the biggest industries in France is apparel and fashion. So they're looking for, they're targeting fashion designers that are coming into their country looking to sell foreign apparel. You can tell a fashion designer the minute they get off a plane, wave them over, open the suitcase, and inside the suitcase are these gorgeous garments with hang tags on them. Whether that fashion desi de designer knew it or not, he unintentionally ended up smuggling, and he needs to post some type of guarantee to get in. So why use an ATA carnet as opposed to the other options? Well, the ATA Carnet eliminates posting that financial guarantee. So there's no need to secure a temporary importation bond in the foreign country or a letter of credit or a bank guarantee. It's all done here in the United States in the Carnet document. So let's look at some of our biggest trading partners. If you were not to use a Carnet, you would go into the European Union, you're posting the minimum of 20% of the value, which is the VAT, not including duty uh, calculations. 
Look at Mexico. Mexico's our friend to the South. Mexico's NAFTA. Mexico's duty free. It's all wonderful and dandy, but you still have to post a 16% import tax to get into Mexico, even though the goods are duty free. ATA Carne, as I said in one of my opening slides, is duty and tax free. And that's a very important distinct, uh, differential because I get a lot of questions from people. Well, if I'm going to a free trade agreement country, why would I use a Carne? The goods are duty free. Yes, but have you looked at what the import tax requirements are? The United States has no import tax, but most of our biggest trading partners, including our duty-free country partners, have import tax. And that needs to be posted in addition to um, if they're duty-free or not. And the ATA Cone waives that import tax as well. As I mentioned, it replaces the temporary importation under bond or other type of financial guarantee. It is one document for all customs transactions. What does that mean? It takes care of your U.S. exportation takes care of your importation into the foreign country, your re-exportation from that country. And let's say you go to a second or third country. Now you've had four, five, six different customs clearances. Then you return to the United States, takes care of your returning American goods or your certificate of registration back into the United States. That is all packaged neatly into one nice document, just like a passport. There is an exception. ATA Carnets do not exempt you from any export or import licensing requirements. So if there are any partner government agencies, and I will go into a little more detail later, but any export import licenses that are required by participating government agencies are required in addition to the ATA Cone. Because what the ATA Cone replaces is the documentation to do with duty and tax assessment, not participating government agency requirements. And that goes for anywhere in the world. We have an FDA here in the United States. Other countries have their own similar FDA agencies that have their own requirements. So Amanda, um, real quick, you mentioned multiple times in there that you know started in, in the US. Well, we obviously have some companies here that are multinational companies that, but maybe, Compliance is handled here here in the US as long as a country is a member of the Carnet Does the Carnet ever have to come through the US? And no, it does not actually it's a very interesting question So we do work with obviously uh, multinational corporations and they cl compliance is headquartered here in the United States They will manage the compliance. Let's say you have the manufacturing um, plant is actually in China and they want to send samples from China to the sales team in the European Union that Carnet can be obtained in China from CCPIT, and then that goes into Europe, travels around Europe as needed, and returns to China. It never has to come to the United States. Great, thank you. Sure. Oh, more benefits. The ATA Carnet benefits list is endless. It allows unlimited entries and departures for up to one year. What that means is I, we have clients that sit on the Canadian border or the Mexican border, and they drive in and out on a daily basis, to using the same Carnet in and out, in and out, as often as they need. It also acts as a U.S. customs registration form. So in the event that you have a carne and you're going to a non-carne country, say you want to go to Argentina, but you need to register your goods with U.S. customs so you can return to the United States without having to do a formal entry. The CBP form for that is the 4455 or Certificate of Registration. There are a lot of limitations to what the Certificate of Registration can be used for, and some ports in the United States, depending on the customs, um, local port policy actually prefer or require a carnet over the registration form. So we see a lot of times customers using carnets just to go in and out of the United States while they're going to non carnet countries, the Caribbean island, most of South America, for example. It minimizes language problems. It's a standardized international harmonized customs document. Split and partial shipments are possible as well. So let's say you're in the medical device business and you're going to that huge uh, Medica show in Germany and you take thousands of items to that show. You list them all on the Carnet. You have your booth, you have your demo units, you have all your display cases, all that's on the Carnet. You come back from Medica and you have a great opportunity to go into it, to visit a hospital in Canada who you met at the show in Medica and all you want to do is take one demo unit of the thousand items on the carnet. That's no problem at all. Grab your carnet, you do a split partial shipment into Canada. So it allows for a lot of flexibility within the year period the carnet is valid for. But the best part of all, arrangements are made in advance in American English in US dollars. So what type of goods qualify for ATA carnet? Based on the opening slide, everything and anything can qualify for an ATA carnet. 
as long as it's intended for professional purposes, intended for temporary exportation and reimportation, and it falls into one of these three very broad categories. Commercial samples, goods used to generate a sales order, not for sale, but to generate the sales order. Professional equipment, tools of the trade, mining equipment, camera equipment, earth boring machines, drilling equipment, you name it. If you're going in for professional purposes, the ATA Connect covers those tools. And finally, goods for exhibitions and fairs and similar cultural events, trade shows, conferences, congresses, any type of exhibition, whether it's an art gallery opening or whether it's a massive convention. So let's look at some real life ATA Connect shipment examples. You've got wearing apparel, camera equipment, display booths, human skulls, trade show booths, musical instruments, power systems. The human skulls, that one, I know I get a lot of raised eyebrows on that. Uh, medical shows and medical testing will use real human skulls and they go on Carnet. Also the famous bodies exhibit. If any of you uh, enjoyed visiting the bodies exhibit, well, it's toured the world multiple times on ATA Carnet. Power systems I find a very interesting example. So the city of Dublin took their entire city off electrical grid. To keep the city alight and functioning, they actually rented generators from the United States. They took the generators over into Ireland, entered them on Carnet, the project lasted six months, they returned them back to the United States, and the citizens of Dublin had no idea they're running on American generators while their power grid was being fixed. And that was all possible because of ATA Carnet. I have another story of a, a, actually, there's a jewelry a user who is probably the best advocate for ATA Carnets. He's a American-based jewelry manufacturer, gorgeous jewelry, and he had his opportunity to sell or make a presentation for sale at one of the largest, most high-end department stores in London. So this is an opportunity of a lifetime for an American jeweler. He's so excited, he grabs his jewelry and they travel, as you know, jewelers like to travel with them on their body, take his jewelry and he arrives in Heathrow Airport and he's super nervous, ready to go and Her Majesty's Customs says, well, welcome to England, step over here, sir. Where is your importation documentation? You have thousands of dollars worth of jewelry here, you need to post $80,000 right now to enter the country. So he calls his logistics provider and says, what, what do I do? I don't know how to secure $80,000 to give Her Majesty's Customs to be able to enter. And the recommendation was, get on the next flight home to America. There will be an ATA carnet waiting for you. Get back on the next flight back to the UK, enter into the United Kingdom on the carnet, and that jeweler has become a very big avid user of ATA Carnets, as you can imagine. Most importantly, what goods are not covered on ATA Carnet? Consumables. Whatever's going in on an ATA Carnet must come out. So trade show exhibitors, if you have booths, tchotchkes, giveaways, pens, brochures, none of that can be on an ATA Carnet. That has to be on a commercial invoice, not on the Carnet. Food items. Food items is interesting. If the food is intended to be consumed, then it cannot be on an ATA carnet. But if it is for display purposes only, and it can be confirmed that it's display purposes only, then it, then it can go on an ATA carnet. For example, there's this auction house in New York City that has a huge wine auction. And before the wine auction, they send the wine on carnet around the world so the potential bidders can inspect the seal, the color, the sediment without actually opening or sampling the wine. Then it returns to the United States and goes up on auction for bid. And then it can be a permanent export and no longer needs the carnet. Disposable items, obviously, postal traffic, nothing shipping through the postal system can be on ATA carnet for all the obvious reasons. It's a very hard mechanism to ensure customs clearance, proper customs clearance is done. And personal cars for touring on the open road. Now, if we talk about cars like NASCAR, Formula One, anything for big, private, large corporate events where the cars are in a closed racetrack environment, or even hot weather testing, cold weather testing, or TV commercials or movies, those cars can be on an ATA carnet because they are in a closed environment. Even if barricades are put up on the road to block the road from traffic to make the TV commercial, that qualifies for ATA carnet. But personal cars that are touring on the open road cannot be on an ATA carnet. They need to be on what's called a CPD carnet. Carnet du passage en aduane. My knowledge of the CPD carnets ends there. It is an uh, Alliance International Tourism Convention, not a World Customs Organization convention. Uh, I can send you to the entity in Paris if you ever had to have questions on personal touring, cars for personal touring. 
But regular cars coming for showroom to sit, look pretty on a showroom floor or at a, a big auto show, that's absolutely fine on ATA Connect. No substantial transformation. As I mentioned, what goes in must come out and it must come out in the exact same manner it went in. So it cannot undergo any further processing, any change in value, or any tariff shift. Which brings me to no repairs, no replacements. So if you have, let's say you've uh, loaned a simulator to South Korea, the simulator in South Korea breaks. They want to send it back to the United States on an ATA Con A to be repaired and possibly have replacement parts. It cannot come into the US on a South Korean uh, Carnet. It has to come into the United States, be repaired, and undergo those US customs regulations that govern repair and replacement parts. So where can ATA Carnets be used? You probably heard a bunch of numbers out there, 100, 100 countries, 77 member countries. There are officially 77 signatory countries to the World Customs Organizations Convention. And of those 77 countries, some of them administer customs in other territories. So there's about 100 customs territories that accept ATA Carnet. For example, France covers Monaco, French side of St. Martin, St. Bart's falls under the Netherlands, Spain covers Canary Islands, and South Africa covers Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana, and Swaziland. So it comes to about 100 territories. And to this day, we get calls about projects in some of the strangest and oddest little islands in the world. And we're more than happy to look up and see who actually governs their customs because we'll be surprised at how many little, little islands that can accept Carnet under who is actually governing or administering customs in that territory. As you can see, there's lots of new members to the ATA Carnet system. The system is consistently growing and it is an incredible tool for our country's economy. In 2016, finally Brazil joined the system just in time for the Olympics, which was perfect timing on Brazil's behalf. Uh, Madagascar joined in 2013. And 2011, which was huge for the US economy, is Mexico. Mexico finally joined the ATA Cone system. And I know this has been a great benefit for our US businesses. Coming soon on the radar, supposedly for this year, maybe next, to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Vietnam. So how does an ATA carnet work? It's really simple, just like your personal passport. It's a color-coded document. Each color represents a specific part in the customs transaction. So you have the green, which is the master part, the cover of the carnet. All the information housed on the green is for the entire validity period of the carnet. Then you have yellow, whites, and blues, which are made up of counterfoils and vouchers. These counterfoils and vouchers are customs transaction specific. That is where is noted the partial shipments, or if you have an export license, you put the license number for that specific shipment. So those are the customs transaction specific. The vouchers is what customs removes for their records, and the counterfoils is what you keep in the carnet, so it can be returned to the United States and reviewed and matched up and closed out nice and neatly. So this brings me to carnet best practices. What do we recommend for you to be best prepared to make sure that you have a perfect carnet experience and carnet use? Number one, general list, the list of goods on the ATA Cone, and I don't know how much more to stress this, it is very important that you provide a very clearly described list of your goods to your Cone provider with all unique identifying characteristics. The more information you put on that general list, the less likely you will have questions from customs. And I am in a horrible case right now with customs rejecting a Cone because the list was insufficient in their opinion. And I have had to stress it over and over again, more information, the better. Unique identifying characteristics, serial numbers, model numbers, brand names, unique identifying characteristics. Is it a, is it a pop-up booth? Does it have three metal rods? Is it a vinyl booth? Does it have the company logo on it? Does it have the company slogan on it? Is it a white t-shirt? Is it a V-neck? Is it a crew neck? 100% cotton. See it, what I'm getting at, as much information as possible, because the officer at time of clearance is not a commodity specialist. He wants to be able to look at the list and create a picture in his head. If he were to inspect, what is he gonna see? And that's what you want to give him. Make it as easy as possible. As I mentioned earlier, split and partial shipments are possible, but we require a lot of attention. You have to make sure that the items you're cataloging that are going in are coming out. Because if you miss the numbers, then you can be liable for the number that didn't go in or didn't come out or wasn't recorded properly, even though the goods are back in the United States. So when doing split and partial shipments, make sure that you tell your provider exactly which items are shipping and you're absolutely sure which ones they are. 
expired US ATA CONAs must be accepted by US Customs for reimportation. So as I mentioned earlier, ATA CONAs are valid for one year, not longer. There are extension options, so on and so forth, but the convention and the US Customs Directive state the goods have to be out of the foreign country on or before date of expiration. So let's say you present your carnet and your cargo to Shanghai Customs on date of expiration. It's loaded on the ocean vessel on date of expiration, perfectly compliant. Then it sets sail to return to the United States. Obviously, it's going to return to the US and the carnet document would have expired. US Customs is required to accept that for importation. And the reason I stress this, it is without fail that I get this question or a rejection at a customs port and we have to reiterate the regulations to the customs officer. They have to accept an expired U.S. carnet returning home to the United States. They may ask, why did it take you so long? So provide bills of lading, airway bills, or you just did non-carnet country travel because you have to be out of the carnet country on a before date of expiration. Not non carnet countries, you can use different type of importation tools into those countries. <clears throat> if your carnet is lost or missing or you can't find it, the minute you can't find that carnet, call your provider and get a duplicate carnet immediately. Because the best proof to resolve a claim is stamps in a carnet. And the duplicate carnet picks up where the original left off. And I, again, don't know how much to stress that. I get people call, well, I thought I left it in my hotel in Paris off to the trade show call your provider, get a duplicate immediately so they can continue on your carnet travel. Partner government agencies, as I mentioned earlier about export licenses and import licenses, so ATA carnets do not substitute for any partner government agency requirements. So if you're in the food and drug or medical, you've got FDA. If you're in fashion or jewelry, think about CITES, the Convention on International Traffic and Endangered Species. There's a CITES license that's specific to ATA Carnet, because if the US is signatory, most likely you're going to a CITES signatory country. So you'll not only need it for your export out of the US, you'll need your CITES for import into that country. Department of Agriculture, uh, veterinary health certificates if you move horses or you move cattle. And, and don't forget our big, the big ones, ITAR, uh, Department of Commerce, BIS, your DSP 73 licenses under the DDTC, those licenses, if you do anything that is dual use or might be controlled by the US government, you have to have those licenses in place. And actually, the DSP 73 is specific for temporary exports out of the United States and re-imports into the US, and it matches up perfectly with the carnet. Export electronic information filing. While most ATA carnets are exempt from the EEI filing requirement, if you have one of the licenses from one of the sensitive agencies, so we're talking BIS, Department of Commerce, ITAR, uh, DDTC, those licenses are required to file an EEI filing based on the data on the license. If you have a CITES license or you have a food and drug uh, license or veterinary health certificates, then you're still exempt from the EEI filing. The importer security filing. ATA carnets are not exempt from the importer security filing. However, they are exempt from the importer security filing bond requirement. And there's actually a code in the system for Carnet at 06, and it changes the way the data can be entered. The data for an importer security filing on Carnet is a data equivalency. So while it's 10 data elements, it's actually only five repeated a couple of times because your importer of record is the hol holder on the Carnet. Your export of record is the holder on the Carnet. The ultimate consignee, the holder on the Carnet. So the information is repetitive because it is a Carnet shipment. The secret to ATA Carnet success is the ATA Carnet along with the goods must always be together for customs clearance. And when in doubt, call your Carnet provider. As long as the Carnet meets up with the goods for customs clearance, you're good to go. But that means do not put the Carnet inside the box when you ship it. Do not attach the Carnet to the side of the box. It will get lost. Make sure that it is handled by your provider and meets up with the goods when it's ready for customs clearance. So how does an exporter obtain an ATA carnet? It's really easy. Look to your logistics provider. And actually, Scarborough is a full-fledged ATA carnet provider. So what it, talking about the application process and obtaining a carnet, there is a security deposit requirement that you should be aware of. The U.S. Council for International Business requires that every ATA, and actually, well, I'll step, take a step back. The ATA carnet convention requires that every ATA carnet have a security deposit tied to it. 
the U.S. Council sets the requirements here in the United States, what, and what can be posted and how much should be posted. They typically require 40% of the value of the goods. Unless you're planning on shipping to Brazil, then they've increased the requirement to 60%. India is 55%. That is because of the import duties and taxes and possible penalties that Brazil or India might impose on an ATA kind of shipment. And same applies for vehicles. So if you're a motorized vehicles and you're a corporation that owns these vehicles, then it's 100% of the value of security. If you're a private corporation, 150%, uh, I'm sorry, if you're a private individual, personal individual, it's a personal car, then it's 150% of the value. And that's the US Council's requirement. This can be posted in form of cash or can be posted as an ATA kind of surety bond. So how long does it take to obtain a carne? Really quick and simple. Well, I know we keep referring it to the passport. It's a lot faster than the passport system. Standard processing is two business days. So if you were to submit your carne today on Wednesday, it's in your hands on Friday. Rush processing, tomorrow turnaround, in your hands tomorrow. And for those of you who needed it yesterday, there's a same day processing option and it's available at pickup locations across the country. It would be remiss to not talk about insurance when talking about ATA carnets, because ATA carnet shipments are exposed to a variety of different risks than your standard transit policy. So your, your standard transit insurance, which I'm sure you all have, covers the goods from point A to point B. Does not cover the goods while they're continually traveling in a circular motion back to the United States. ATA Kone Cargo Insurance is an enhanced insurance policy that covers the specific risks that ATA Kone Cargo is exposed to. It automatically is written to cover used goods because the minute you go to one trade show with your new trade show booth, your booth is used. So it's already embedded in the policy to cover those used goods. It covers goods to, from, and during the event. So it actually covers while in use. So if you have, you're an exhibitor and you have um, a TV screen, you're projecting images on the TV screen and somebody bumps into it and the TV screen goes flying and it's completely smashed, this insurance actually covers that. <coughs> it also covers goods hand carried on commercial airlines. So if you get your carnet from your logistics provider, and decide to hand carry them, and you have the insurance policy, you're covered, even on commercial airlines. But the best part of all is if your goods are lost or stolen in the foreign country, Foreign Customs holds you liable for full duties, taxes, and penalties because you entered it into their economy and made it available for the thieves to steal. Customs cannot get their hands on the thieves to charge them the duties, taxes, and penalties. So what do they do? They come to you and say, you owe us duties, taxes, and penalties. This insurance policy reimburses that duty in the event the goods are lost or stolen. So that is really a winner. And I recommend if you're using Carnets, go back and look at the insurance policies you have, whether it's your cargo policy, whether it's your business policy, and make sure that you have these highlights covered in the policy if you're doing Carnets. And that actually ends my presentation. I'm going to open it up to Adam to ask questions. Well, we, we have a few that have already come in. You answered a few that came in along the way. Um, I have a few written down here. Um, so a couple of questions that, that kind of go together here is, so there's a lot of questions coming in on, I set my carnet up for X, but then Y happens. Maybe I need to add, add additional countries or what if I need to sell the goods? So can you kind of talk through both of those scenarios? And then I guess the, the third scenario to kind of talk through is, maybe I have a carnet and I'm getting ready to go on a global trade show and I might hit a dozen countries, but only half of those countries participate in the carnet program. Is that okay? Okay. You might have to remind me as I go through answering. Cool. So number one, you obtain your ATA carnet and you think you're only going to say Thailand and you're not going anywhere else but Thailand. You come back to the US, but your Thai trip was such a great opportunity that now you, you really, the world has opened up and you want to go to South Korea and Australia. All you do is request additional sets and slip them into the carnet. As long as it's the same goods listed on the carnet, you can add countries and continue on the country travel. And to answer the second question about selling goods off an ATA carnet, the ATA Kone is intended for temporary importation, not for sale. That is the standard answer. And then the exception is, is absolutely, you can sell goods off an ATA Kone. What you need to be aware of is one, you're gonna pay obviously the duty based on the HTS classification, the tax of that country, 
and then you're going to pay a 10% penalty. That 10% penalty is not the value of the goods. It's 10% of the sum of the duties and taxes. So the penalty ends up being a slap on the wrist for breaching the ATA carnet. Each country has different procedures, or you just let it flow through the ATA Carnet Guarantee Association, where the Chambers of Commerce, like the Council here in the United States, will handle it with, say, the, Fran the Paris Chamber, and they will settle it all with customs and then just send you an invoice. In those cases, I would advise that it be aware that they do have claims processing fees. Obviously, the Chambers are going to charge that for being the middleman. But it all depends on the country. And I always say the relationship you have with customs in that country you can settle it right there in country, or you can return to the U.S. and let the Guarantee Association settle the claim for you. But always calculate duties plus tax plus the 10% of the duty and taxes penalties. Now, if you, are, if you do this one too many times out of the same port, we have this with, there's a retail show, IJL, for jewelry in London, and Heathrow Customs picked up on a lot of jewelers from the U.S. We're using Carnets to go to the retail show, 50-50 chance they sell anything. And they were selling, and it became too repetitive. And Heathrow Customs did call the council and say, look, guys, you need to get a leash on your jewelers. This is obviously exceeding the exceptions. But the whole point of ATA Carnet is to foster and grow trade. So if a sale is inevitable, there's no reason to stop the sale. And then the final question, Adam, was? So, um, if, so let's use that example that, that you talked about where I go to Thailand, right? And then, but I'm, I'm also planning on going to another dozen countries after Thailand until I make it home. But only six of those countries that I'm going to have signed and participate in carnets. Can I still get a carnet or do, do I have to have an entry? How does that process work with my carnet? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. You can absolutely get an ATA carnet. What you do is you use your carnet for export out of the United States. Let's say you go into um, South Africa. So you get your carnet validated in South Africa. You get your carnet closed out of South Africa. And then you decide to go from South Africa to Chad. You enter into Chad on whatever their temporary admission requirement is. And then you export out of there whatever their temporary admit requirement is. And then go to, say, the UK and enter in on the carnet. UK customs may ask, why is the importation into the UK so much longer or so much time has passed since the exportation out of South Africa on the carnet? And you can say, well, here's my proof I went to Chad instead of going straight to the UK. And that's perfectly, and that happens all the time, especially in South America, where you have Chile and Brazil are carnet countries, but Argentina, Peru, and Uruguay are not. And a lot of businesses will do that circuit with their samples and not do different entries for Uruguay, Argentina, and Peru, and use the carnet for the Brazil and Chile leg of their trip. Okay, so so I can still get one even if I'm not going there. So that's definitely good to Absolutely. know. Absolutely. So you talked a, a little bit about it, and I just want to reiterate it again, is that, you know, what happens if something doesn't come back? Obviously, there there's part of this that is a positive. I've gone somewhere, I've taken a sample, someone's wanted to buy a sample off of um, then, then there's the other side of it is I've taken, I've taken a hundred items over somewhere and then I only bring 99 back. I left one in my hotel room, something happens, we've all traveled and we all leave things. So walk us through that process. Maybe not, you know, there's so many things on, on the list. You, you finally make it back to the U S and like you only brought 99 on so, um, I went over the selling, you can leave something in a country, you can sell it, you can handle the breach in that country. And so, and that's perfectly fine. If you lose something or forget something, customs will hold you liable for that one item. You only ever pay the duties, tax and penalties on the items not re-exported. So in the case of a, we had a situation with a camera crew in, and believe it or not, in a hotel in Canada and their hotel room was raided and the cameras were all stolen and they were entered on Carnet. Canada Customs held them entirely liable for the duties, tax and penalties on those camera equipment that was stolen. And thankfully they had, thankfully they had ATA Carnet cargo insurance, which covered 
A, the loss of the goods, well, the cost of the replacement of the goods, and B, it also covered the duties, taxes, and the penalties that Canada was charging against that carnet. So it all depends on the scenario. If you don't get your goods out of a country, whether it's one, whether it's 100, you will be liable for duties, taxes, and um, penalties. Now, if you get them out, but let's say you skip Italian customs, they're notorious for smoke breaks. And I've had so many people call me and say, look, I tried, but there was nobody at the office. It was closed and I had to catch my flight. You jump on the plane, you get back to the US, and again, it's you come in through LaGuardia Airport, there's no customs officer readily available, and you miss US customs. You have to, immediately that happens, you have to prove the goods on US soil. Whether you do a certificate of disposition with a US customs form 3227, or you go back with your carnet and get that yellow counterfoil re-imported into the US. The proof, and obviously ideally before expiration date, and some countries won't accept a proof post expiration date, but if you can prove the goods on US soil, that will mitigate, if not resolve the claim entirely. It, so in the case of Singapore, it'll resolve the entire claim, except for what they call regularization fee, which is slapping on the wrist for skipping Singapore customs, and it's 150 bucks more or less. But it's better than looking at a $10,000 penalty. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, you kind of stepped into the, the price side of this, so there, there's been a few questions come in. Um, the first one is, so you talk about having to post, whether it's 40%, you can post a bond, but someone asks, if the value of what you're sending, so maybe this coffee cup that I have here um, is, is the best coffee cup in the world, and I want to take it on a sample, but maybe the coffee cup only costs $10, you know, is there a value of goods that, that you think makes more sense to, so, so is there a, a, a floor on the value of goods that you're sending on a carnet? Or does it, if the goods are $10, you would still recommend a carnet? Or where does that kind of cost start to break even for someone that, that wants to move their goods on a carnet? I would say it all depends on the de minimis requirements in the country you're entering and when you are turning back to the United States. Because if you still, let's say it's a $10 coffee cup, but I'm not sure what, let's say, Indonesia's de minimis rule is. I don't know what the de minimis requirement, but hypothetically say they have no de minimis, and you still have to go through a formal entry posting, then the carnet makes sense. But if you're going to come into the United States with a $10 cup and the de minimis is $800, well, there's no reason to, you, don't, you are exempt from filing any formal entry anyways. So that really is, it all depends on the country of destination. That makes sense. So on the opposite side of that, is there any value limit for a carnet? No, not at all. We've seen it all. <laughs> what What's the largest carnet that you've seen so far? Well, I, it depends on whether it's the commodity ratio. So the, um, the $4 million book uh, written by J.K. Rowling, Tales of Beadley Barb, it was leather bound with silver ornamentation and appraised at $4 million. <laughs> that was kind of a shocker. Yeah. Yeah. I had to actually verify that it was legitimately a book worth $4 million before we were able to approve the release of the carnet. Um, so I guess that we've seen some crazy situations. There is no minimum and maximum because while the carnet does replace duties and taxes, it also replaces all the other hassles of what you need to do to enter a country temporarily. So it's right. really weighing up what your odds are. Now, if you're telling me you're taking a car to Canada once, you're not going to need to post more than 15% to enter Canada. That's max going in. So I would say if you're going to Canada once, once only for sure, I would recommend not post using a carnet to go to Canada if it's one trip. Now, if you go to Canada twice, then the carnet immediately makes sense because you don't have to post a bond twice. You already have one carnet. Um, and, and those are honest conversations I'm happy to have because, and, and this is something I have spoken to the council about while going to Canada, the maximum anybody has to post is really only 20% of the value, yet the council's requiring 40% plus the cost of the carnet. So it, 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 it makes it cost prohibitive, really, going to Canada once. But the minute somebody goes to Canada twice, like a touring rock band, they obviously use Carnets because it's so much easier. Right. Well, I, I think there's, there's another question, which is more favorable, a Carnet or a temporary import. And so I'll talk about that for just a minute from a customs broker perspective. And, and that is, is that 
temporary importation, especially if we're talking about into the U.S. and then back out of, um, it's, it's somewhat cumbersome. Um, we, we have clients that, that use the process. Um, you know, goods have to be exported. There, there really is no way to not export those goods without a lot of penalties and things like that. We're actually filing a customs entry electronically with, when we're doing a temporary import. Um, a, a carne um, is, is kind of a unique thing because in the world that we live in, the carne is still a paper document. Um, you talked about it kind of moving with the goods and, and that's a very true statement. It is, a, it is pieces of paper that actually do move with the goods and, and as far as a customs procedure goes, it's just much simpler. And actually, I'll further on that, Adam, um, I agree. I mean, one, you have to look at what qualifies for TIB. Does your commodity qualify for TIB? Mm -hmm. Pretty easy for anything to qualify for carne. It's non-consumable and it's intended to come out. And there's nothing more than that. It doesn't have to fall under any HDS classification or Chapter 98 or so on and so forth. But also keep in mind, while you're looking at what are your temporary entry options in that country, don't forget you need to register with U.S. Customs as well. So it's a four part versus TIBs are only for the country of import. You still have to worry about what you have to handle on export and reimportation from home country. Correct. And Carnet is all that neatly packaged in one. There's no question. There's no guessing. Um, we have a, a really specific one here and is our car, our Carnet is applicable for the metal recycling industry. So I take scrap metal from here. I send it overseas. Um, for metal recycling and it comes back. Now maybe it is, you know, maybe it's aluminum that I've taken in here. I've done something, I've done something here. I then turn around, I've sent it back to, um, let's say Japan. Japan um, takes all of my scraps and then sends me back in, in essence raw material again that's been recycled from my scrap. Does something like that apply? My question would be, does there, is there a change in value and does there, is there an HDS classification shift? I don't know the answer to either one of them. <laughs> That's really the deciding. So it's, a, so for example, uh, Stradivarius violins, and this is actually a customs case. Uh, there's a Stradivarius violin company in New York city who had Stradivarius violins that were untuned and they, obtained an ATA Carnet, their big mistake was they listed on the Carnet at the value that the Stradivarius violin was untuned, which is firewood in their opinion. It was a way to save money, um, which is not always the smartest decision, and they shipped it over to Italy. And in Italy, it was tuned. So now it became um, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of musical instruments, um, and these Stradivarius came back to the United States. Well, one, this is something I learned reading the customs case, Italy is the only place you can tune Stradivarius violin. So there was a lot for customs to be able to target them. And when they noticed the huge difference in value, Stradivarius violins coming in on a carnet from Italy and the value listed on the carnet is so low and that was went out, but obviously they're tuned and now being used. Now they're worth a lot more money. So that's a case where they were fined terribly. If they had put the initial value, what would it be when it's tuned? The actual value of the Stradivarius violins, then it would have qualified because there's no tariff shift for an untuned violin versus a tuned violin, but they listed the wrong value. So that's why the question is, how much is the value change? In other examples, we do art uh, appraisals. The artist is gonna take a wild guess in hopes that the appraisal is on the same line, but we do a lot of art to England for to be appraised, to return back. So we always say list as high as you possibly can think of, because if that appraisal comes in and it's around that number, you'll be okay, because the art itself has not changed. Right. So um, if I have my carnet here in the US, can I convert my carnet into a consumption entry? The answer is, uh, you can keep your goods here on a US, but you cannot convert it to consumption entry. So the terms actually need to change. So basically, if you have your goods here on a foreign car in the United States and you want to keep them here, either divert to home use or convert to, in layman's terms, let's say consumption entry to be kept here in the U.S. indefinitely, it is actually considered an anticipatory breach. What you need to do is send a letter to the port of entry requesting an anticipatory breach. On the letter, include the HTS classification for the items, include a copy of the green cover, the green general list and the importation counterfoil stamped by customs on import. 
And then customs will create a case number and charge liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are the duty plus the 10% penalty. If, if it's a duty-free item, then it's a minimum and it's somewhere between $100 and $150. Don't quote me on it. They have some schedule, but basically you're looking at about 100, 150 bucks if it's a duty-free item. But you have to do the anticipatory breach procedure. Do not try and convert it to a consumption entry because that will not go through very well. Hmm. If, we have another question here. If I get a claim notice for my carnet, what do I need to do next to resolve it? What are my next steps? Who do I call? So you've received a claims notice from the U.S. Council for International Business, who's been informed by Foreign Customs that, oops, there's no proof your goods ever exited the country. One, look at your carnet. Hopefully you've returned it to your carnet provider for review and assessment. Make sure that it has either the exportation counterfoil in it or the importation counterfoil. So if you go through the steps, you get a claims notice. Number one, check your carnet. Where is it? What proof do you have in it? Did it stamp out of the foreign country properly? It could have stamped out of, could have come in through the UK and stamped out of Germany. Well, it's going to change in Brexit. It could have gone in through France and stamped out of Germany. While that is technically a claim, it's not because the German export counterfoil will resolve the claim entirely. And so look in your carnet. Uh, two, if you don't have exportation out of the foreign country, do you have your importation back into the United States? Then use that as proof. If you don't have that, Get a certificate of disposition immediately. And actually, my recommendation is always to look at your carnet when it's returned back. Or if you're using Scarborough, for example, that's what they're going to do. They're going to make sure that everything's done properly. And if it's not done properly, they're going to come up with a fix that can be done immediately. The thing with carnets is when as soon as there's an error, time is of the essence. Because any proof prior to expiration date will suffice. Any proof post expiration date will depend on the country if they're willing to accept it or not as sufficient proof. Some will waive entirely and just do a slap on the wrist penalty. Others will charge full duties and tax and penalties irrespective of the fact that your goods here in the US and but the proof was presented post expiration date. Then if you don't have any of that, look at your shipping documents. Ideally, you have the carnet number on all supporting documentation. That is my one of my best recommendations. And actually I have a I take it back. I have a better recommendation. <laughs> So I have a, and I'll start by telling you a horrible story. I have a lot of stories, as Adam likes to tease me. Um, the So famous TV show, you're going to know who I'm talking about as I get through the story. They rent their gear in a rental house in LA. They fly over to Germany. They enter into Germany on the carnet, and everything's great. They race across Europe filming. Everything's fantastic. They export out of Charles de Gaulle. Carnet's validated. Wonderful. And they enter back into JFK. JFK stamps the carnet back in. This is great. And it was a hand carry. This is all great. These guys are golden. They jump in the rental car. For some unknown reason, they decided to stop at some shop restaurant place near JFK airport. And when they came back out, their car had been robbed. The gear was all in the trunk, but they somebody had stolen all the backpacks. All the carnets were in the backpacks. They decided, well, they're, they're good. They know they did everything properly. Everything's golden. They've been doing carnets since the creation of the TV show. They return all the gear to the rental house and don't think twice about it. Well, they get a lovely letter from the U.S. Council saying German Customs has no proof of re-exportation out of Germany and that they owe $120,000 worth of duties, taxes, and penalties. And they say, no, 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 we swear goods are back in the U.S. Okay, where's the proof? Well, the carnets were stolen. Okay, well, did you take photocopies? Did you take photographs? Like, what, what did you have anything? Nothing. The rental gear had already been returned to the rental house and other producers had taken the gear. So we couldn't even collect the gear together to get a 3227 done to prove the goods were exported. They ended up, despite the amount of lawyers involved, they ended up having to pay the claim. And since that incident, my number one recommendation is smartphone photos. Every time that carnet touches customs, make it part of your business procedure. Have somebody photograph it on a smartphone because that would have been sufficient for us to resolve the claim. Or photocopies, every time it gets back to an office, photocopy, keep the, keep the path going. Because while it is still a paper document, those are some of the hiccups. If it's lost, we don't have proof. So that's my number one recommendation, take photo photographs at any customs checkpoint. But again, back to resolving the claim, you've gotta be able to provide proof of the goods back in the United States. If you don't know what to do, call your Kone provider. We're all more than happy to walk you through the process and figure out what needs to be done to resolve that claim. Got it. So 
someone sent in, what does the ATA of Carnate stand for? <laughs> it stands for Amission Temporaire, Temporary Admission. They put them together and it became ATA. There you go. Um, I actually never, never knew that either. I'm glad someone asked that. <laughs> um, so, it, so you, you talked a little bit about Canada and, and if you're going once, maybe a carnet doesn't make sense, but let's bring up Thailand again. And, you know, Thailand's part of, you know, is a carnet country. So if, so if I'm only going to Thailand once, I'm taking three things over, I'm bringing three things back. Do you still do a carnet? When it comes to Thailand, I would recommend it. Um, one, Thailand is, 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 you know, if you, you have a difference between a very developed countries like the European Union or Canada, uh, the ease of customs clearance is very easy. With Thailand, it's a little more unknown. I, I would recommend the Carnet because it does standardize and harmonize temporary entry clearances, as well as keep in mind, you have to bring those goods back to the United States as well. And I would look at, I mean, if you want to delve in deeper, we say, okay, what are the temporary entry requirements for Thailand? And if you're going once, is it in your benefit or not? Got it. So you, you talked about um, that the carnet is good for, for a year. Now, with a temporary importation, especially if we're talking about just here in the U.S., there's the ability to extend that past a year. How does that work with the carnet? Is there an option to extend it? What if I'm not ready to come home with the goods yet? How does that work? So the answer is absolutely. There are extension options. It all depends on the country. The most common extension option is actually what we call a replacement carnet. The language of the convention gets to be a little finicky, but basically a replacement carnet is an extension carnet. It's a second carnet that is issued here in the United States. The council requires that it has US Customs validation done by council appointed person to be able to get U.S. Customs to validate a carnet when the goods are overseas. And then that replacement carnet meets up with the original carnet, the original is closed out, and then the goods are allowed to stay in that country or travel on for a whole nother year. The thing with replacement carnets are time is of the essence. As soon as you think the goods are not exiting the country or you need to keep them longer, call your carnet provider and one, make sure that country actually accepts extension carnets. Two, um, you have to submit an application form and then we, what we do is we go to the administrator, the customs administration in that country and actually request approval. So there is a, a little bit of a lead time on the application process. So as soon as you think you're going to keep the goods, call your provider. We can see a, does the country qualify or will accept replacements? If yes, then we go through that process. If no, what are your other options? Most countries who don't accept the extension carnet option, actually allow to convert to a temporary importation under bond. So what that is, is it's a TIB for an additional year on top of the carnet. And so the United States does not accept extension carnets, but they do have a conversion process where you convert the carnet to a TIB. You were talking earlier about um, a, a fight that, that you're currently in with, with customs about items that, you know, you say we're on the packing list, and custom says, well, no, they're not. You know, walk us through some of that. How did, how did those things get resolved? Is it just a lot of back and forth? Or is there a process for things like that to get resolved? Because, you know, for, for a lot of people here is they put things like, um, you know, maybe they use their commercial invoice description for the description on the carnet. Well, maybe that's not good enough. That is, yeah, that is correct. It's not good enough. Um, hopefully, it depends on who your carnet provider is. Um, we're very strict. So with Scarborough, Scarborough, you'll be very strict with your clients and push back on them. Um, some of the questions I've had have actually been for non-hour carnets. And the list was released out of their office. The carnet was released without any further scrutiny. And it this one person, while it was accepted out of the U.S. by customs, it was accepted into Mexico on export. Mexican customs said, oh, no, there's no way we can tie this generalized list description to these physical goods. And so they refused to have the exportation, allow the exportation out of Mexico. 
while we're trying to assist this company and help them as much as possible, there's only so much we can do in those cases. And we actually get involved the ATA Con A chain and we try and build a case. So do you have photographs of the items um, to show that they're specific catalogs that ties um, style numbers or model numbers to the specific items. So, but to avoid all of that, it's really recommended to have a really clear description and a good Con A provider will push back on you. And while I know a lot of people get very irritated with that pushback, it is actually way better in the long run because we're noticing customs is just getting stricter and stricter. And we notice that on all type of shipments, whether it's Corneo, whether it's a regular shipment. So the more information, the better. Well, great. I think that about wraps us up. Um, one more question that I'll knock out here and it's, can I get a copy of this presentation? The answer um, to anyone on this is yes. Um, here in about the next day or so. Um, this entire presentation will be posted on Scarborough's YouTube channel. Um, you'll be able to go out and watch this webinar again. You'll get a copy of the presentation. Um, so I do urge you guys to go on and uh, uh, look at it, forward it on to somebody else. Um, and with that, Amanda, thank you very much um, for your time and expertise this afternoon. And um, I look forward to seeing uh, you in San Diego here in a couple months. Sounds good. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you everyone who attended today. All right. Bye-bye.